Today we're going to be testing out the Chidi Plus 4 to see if it's truly one of the best 3D printers on the market right now. Let's start off by getting this printer out of the box. This machine was very kindly sent over by Chidi for me to test out, but you know how we roll on this channel. I never hold back from criticism and just want to showcase what these machines are capable of creating. Due to the fully enclosed design of this printer, there really isn't a whole lot of assembly involved. The most difficult part of the setup was probably wrestling this giant and quite heavy machine out of the box. There are these really interesting handles that are part of the top design of this printer, which does make it a lot easier to get out of the box than and other machines, but it is still quite a heavy printer, so probably get somebody to help you out with maneuvering it to where you want this machine set up. While I'm still working on getting all of the plastic off of this printer, let's talk about some of the features that the Plus 4 has. It has a build volume of 305 millimeters by 280 millimeters, which puts it into that helmet printing class range. It has auto bed leveling, filament runout and tangle detection, a built-in camera, and active chamber heating with a new and stronger heater. Something that is unique to this machine is that it uses wider belts than any other enclosed printer on the market right now, which is supposed to improve surface quality. I guess we'll find out though. But back to the printer setup, the two boxes that came packaged underneath the machine are what have all of the tools, accessories, and instructions in them. Step one is going to be attaching the door handle. Well, first we're going to take off the packaging that is on the door. The bolts to install the handle come pre-installed on the handle itself, so you're going to first unscrew those before using them to then actually attach the handle to the glass. Next up is the screen, which comes protected in its own little box. And all this installation entails is plugging in this one cable and running it along these clips in the back to hold the cable in place. And then it's just lining up some of the other hooks on the back of the screen to the machine and sliding it in place to lock it in. And the last thing left to do is to plug in the power cord and turn the machine on. From there, it'll bring you to a fairly typical setup screen, you know, select your language and all of that. But something that is more unique to Chidi printers is that the machine itself will actually run you through the rest of the setup process. Once you've finished one step, you hit the arrow button and it will take you to the next step to take, which honestly, most of this is removing additional packaging. So next it's on to removing these additional bed screws. These are a fairly common occurrence in enclosed machines they are added to help keep the bed in place during shipping. At this time, I also removed the plastic packaging that was around the build plate and then reinstalled that back onto the hotbed. Now that the bed is unlocked, the next thing that this machine does is essentially a bit of a test run just to make sure that everything is moving appropriately. This is sped up a bit, but it just ended up moving the bed up and down a couple of times to make sure everything was working right. After that, the machine prompts you to install the spool holder. The first step is to slide off the back plate that is packaged on the main sort of body of the spool holder, and this is what we will actually be installing on the machine. The bolts that we need for this are already attached to the machine, so we're going to unscrew those and then re-screw them back in to attach this back plate. While having the hardware pre-attached and needing to unscrew it is a bit more work, it is a lot more convenient this way than having to sift through little packets of screws and trying to figure out which ones you need. From there, the main body of the spool holder just slides right into place and clicks down. The last piece to install is the part that the spool actually sits on and that also just slides into place. Once the spool holder is being installed, the printer prompts you to load some filament. First, you need to install this small piece of PTFE tube that is included into the side connector and from there load up your filament of choice. Once you've pushed the filament in as far as it seems to be able to go, the printer will then prompt you to input the temperature that this particular filament that you've loaded should be printing at and it will start to heat up to that temperature. This is sped up, don't worry. It does not actually go this fast in real life, although it is still quite fast. And from there you're going to keep on pressing the load button until you visibly see the filament start to come out of the nozzle. I just happened to have chosen the yellow filament just because it was essentially like the first one that I found that was not actually attached to a printer, but it did turn out to be a very good example because you could see it quite easily in this machine. And that's it for the printer setup tutorial. It then of course prompts you to run the calibration, but I first updated it because I knew I was going to need to recalibrate it later. So this is a tip to save time, but there were actually a couple of things that weren't included in the setup tutorial. This one was mostly for me because it made it a lot easier to film, but I did install the the lid onto the top of the printer and then removed any packaging. And the other thing is also packaging related. The charcoal filter at the back has some tape
tape on it and the charcoal pellets, I guess you would call these, inside are in a plastic bag. So I got all of that out of the plastic so that this filter would actually be operational. The last thing is a bit of a bonus extra step. It was mentioned to me by Chidi that there were some machines reported to have this screw at the top of the chamber heater loose due to shipping. Mine was still nice and tight, but it doesn't hurt to check. But now that those last setup steps are done and my update is finished, we can now continue on with the calibration of this printer. As you can see, this screen mentioned it is ideal to set the bed temperature to the bed temperature you will most likely be using during printing. And of course, I'm going to be mostly using ABS and other crazy filaments on this machine. So 100 degrees Celsius it is. While the machine is waiting for the bed to hit the correct temperature, it homes the nozzle and then runs a nozzle cleaning process. It purges a little bit of filament, scrapes that off, goes over to the side that kind of has like a piece of sandpaper to rub the nozzle against, and then it goes back and does like a final swipe over that silicone brush. Overall, I do find that this does a pretty great job at removing any possible extra filament debris from the nozzle. Once it's finished that process and your bed has hit its set temperature, it will begin probing the bed. The Plus 4 uses an induction probe, and what this is doing is creating a mesh to determine whether there are possibly high and lower spots on the bed, where the printer will then compensate for during the printing process. Next is input shaping, where it basically shakes the printer at various frequencies to figure out what, again, the machine needs to compensate for when it's printing at such high speeds. It always looks like it's doing nothing, but it always sounds crazy. And with that, setup and calibration is complete. So let's start getting something printing. I'll be using the new Chidi Studio from my slicer this time around, which is basically a reskinned Orca, and I'm not mad about it. It's got what is probably my favorite innovation in slicer technology, the multi-plate function, so I'm happy. It's also got an information section about how to calibrate and tune settings, as well as a filament guide, which I'm sure will come in very handy for a lot of people. I mean, including me, I just did not notice this very early on in this filming process. If you've been on this channel, Channel for a while, then you probably will know that I am a big believer in putting 3D printers to the test in the ways that I mean to use them. So I'm sure it's going to come as a shock to absolutely no one that the first thing we're going to be printing is parts of a life-size droid head in ABS, because why make it easy for this printer? I did at least restrain myself a little and only put one piece on the plate at a time, just to make sure that my typical ABS settings were still liking the plus four, and this piece turned out beautifully. I didn't use any supports on it, and you can see the overhangs at the top of this piece printed really, really clean and just overall a very smooth print. And with that, I was feeling pretty confident about my settings in this printer, so I did not hold back after that. I will export and link my ABS slicer profile in the description box. It's pretty much what I use for all of my Chidi machines, so even though you might not actually be able to import it for other machines depending on your slicer, you can just look at the settings and like copy and paste them if you have another Chidi printer. It's really nothing fancy, but you all ask and it seems to work, so why not? I know I've mentioned that this machine does have a camera built in, and this is the view, like this is a screen recording from my phone of what I can see on just the fluid interface. Yeah, it's a pretty clear, nice live view of what the machine is working on. The only light in this entire room when shooting this is from the printer because it's in a pitch black room. It was like in the middle of the night. And that also means this printer is completely capable of creating time-lapse videos if you check that setting before before starting the print. And this is what one of those looks like. It basically just takes a picture every time it does a layer change, which then compiled all together creates this nice smooth footage that always kind of looks like it's actually printing because the nozzle isn't in the same place all of the time. It's not actually pausing the print to do this, it's just continually running and taking that picture. And here's what those pieces turned out like. Again, very smooth looking, especially for ABS. You are not using cooling fans the same way that you are for PLA, so there is the chance that there are some more lines here and there on the surface. And I also tend to run the filament maybe a bit hotter than some people would because I would much rather prefer the piece to look a tiny bit melty than the layers not properly bonding to each other. But you can see here, there were some overhangs in the back that I did not put support on, but I did support this front section and the support just removed so easily and the surface
surface texture left was actually pretty incredible. Like for such an intense steep overhang, you pretty much do not get cleaner than that. Especially this is ABS once again, a notoriously difficult filament to print in. From there, I just basically was continuously running off the pieces that I needed for this head. I also can confirm that the filament runout detection works. I was just trying to use up some of these three kilogram ABS spools that I had laying around from the battle droid, I believe, and I just have not used them for another project yet. This mouthpiece was a bit of an experiment. I printed it at 0.12 millimeter layer heights because of the finer detail. It did leave a few little odd artifacts on the side, but overall, again, a pretty smooth and good looking piece. This back head piece though was very impressive. It was the single largest piece that was a part of this head. You can see the little line where I had to do that filament change, but again, very smooth. But this, I decided to not use any support material on the inside overhang and this overhang was intense. So the fact that it looks as good as it does is pretty impressive. It's on the inside of the piece, you're never going to see it and it saved me a lot in support material. After I had all of the droid head pieces printed, I really wanted to print something flat to test out how good of a job this printer was at creating like that perfect first layer. And this machine did not disappoint. I basically maxed out the build volume with this plaque. This is the Living Waters plaque from the Mandalorian and it is printed in this purpley ASA. I also turned on ironing to see what it would do and it's really smooth in some areas. It got a bit weird in others. It could be due to just how complex the surface of this model is or just ASA not liking ironing. I really wanted to go back to something that used a lot of the build volume of this machine. And since I still had that purple ASA installed on the printer, I figured a Sabine helmet was in order. And this is where a bit of my printer bad luck started to happen this week. I would say it's pretty much 100% the combination of filament type as well as helmet design that caused the point of the visor to not print super cleanly. But then I also ran out of ASA and had to do a filament change and it didn't really like the temperature difference between the filaments and so this print could admittedly look better but I do really do not think that this is down to the printer it is really just me not having a good day this day it's ASA so I can fix it and melt it all together later on because as you can see the rest of this helmet looks really beautiful and smooth and all of the support material removed pretty cleanly and easily the inside of the dome that was not supported at all also turned out pretty clean. I mean, it's never going to be perfect when you don't use support material, but in an effort to redeem myself, I decided to print a version of the same helmet, but using support material for that visor point. And as you can see, it turned out even worse. The rest of the helmet though, looks great, but third time's a charm, am I right? <laughs> Honestly, I half thought I was losing it at this point after the last two somewhat failures, but this one was in PLA and you can see how significantly better this point looks and this was much more successful than the ASA ones. So my call of it just being a bad combination of filament and helmet type was right because this thing turned out beautifully. I printed it with the recessed designs on it because this will end up being my paint master. I've always planned on making all five of Sabine's helmets and I'm going to keep them as the live action version. This was pretty crazily the first thing that I did in PLA though, which made me realize something that I didn't even consider and that is just how well the glass doors muffle the sound of this machine. So this is with the door open and now I'm going to close it and you can probably tell the difference here. My camera mic might be flattening out the sound levels a little more, but in real life there is quite a noticeable difference. After the whole Sabine helmet situation, I really just wanted to put this printer to the test in as many ways as I could see fit when I was sort of busy working on other things. So the first thing that I decided to do was test out some PETG since I'd already done pretty much every other filament type that I typically would use. So I printed L3's hand, which is a droid I plan on building hopefully soon. And this is a very intense piece. And I thought it'd be a really interesting test, not only for PETG, but just to see how 
this printer could handle such a complex shape that involved a whole lot of support material, and I would say it handled it pretty darn well. This is one of the most single complex droid pieces I think I have ever seen on any of my droids. The support came off pretty easily given just how wrapped around these fingers it was. I do think I had it printing PETG maybe 5 to 10 degrees hotter than it should have, so in some areas it looks a tiny bit melty, but honestly this is still a really impressive looking piece. Another slightly random piece, but I just genuinely needed this printed and I figured why not use the plus four as a test, were these parts for the T6 base, and these were black PLA and printed absolutely beautifully. After that though, I went back to let's see what other crazy helmets I can fit on this thing mode. This one was a slight fail. I should have realized when it did fit in one piece on this printer that it was scaled small, but I didn't. So I now have a very nice looking child size Captain Rex helmet, once again printed in ABS. I did legitimately want to try and find a helmet that just wouldn't quite fit on this printer and show you how you can get around that, which is how we ended up with a night trooper. Now in most cases in the helmet department, the area that you will start to see helmets not fitting is on the height or Z axis. The darker blue section at the top of the dome is where the printer's height cuts off. Now, thankfully, in most slicers these days, there is literally a cut tool built in. So while you could decide to just chop off that dome part that doesn't quite fit on the machine, I am personally going to be cutting off the bottom of this Stormtrooper helmet because it is going to save me more on support material on supporting that bottom part of the helmet if I just cut the lower edge off. So you move the plane where you want the cut to be performed. You can choose how you want the piece to be oriented after the cut is performed. And when you're you're all good, you can just press perform cut and it will split the piece. And now we have two pieces that will fit no problem on this machine. This uh, main body of the Night Trooper still was a little big, but rotating it 45 degrees so that it printed on the angle meant that it would fit on the build plate, thankfully. I was honestly a little worried there that I maybe had picked too good of an example of not quite fitting on this printer, but we're all good. This ended up being my single longest piece and once again, printed beautifully. This is also in white ABS. It auto-generated some really small supports on the bottom that kind of failed and I didn't catch or else I would have just deleted them because they were not really going to be doing anything for this print. So that is why it looks a little bit messy and stringy in some areas. I also have to give a special shout out to the ears because this looked absolutely insane printing and I had no clue when I saw this in the slicer if it would print successfully, but miraculously it did and these pieces also turned out beautifully. I went ahead, removed all of the support material, and also welded the top and bottom sections together with some acetone. The main section of the helmet lifted a tiny bit on this one corner, so that's why there's still a bit of a gap there because I really did no post-processing to this piece whatsoever beyond just removing the support material and then sticking the two parts together. Very impressed with how this helmet turned out. I've basically had this printer running non-stop for the last two weeks. It's definitely given me the opportunity to print a variety of different types of objects, use a bunch of different filaments, and at this point I feel quite confident in being able to sit down and talk about this printer and give you my thoughts and opinions about my experience so far with it. I'm sure you could probably tell from the rest of this video that overall it's been an incredibly positive experience with the Plus 4 so far. Really the only issues this machine has given me were down to my own printer misfortunes over the last couple of weeks. But yeah, everything else overall I was very happy with the quality of. Of course there could always be room for improvement here in there. I'm sure I've probably already mentioned in the video when it comes to ABS and ASA. I do not mind the parts looking a little melty just because then I know they're structurally sound and they're not going to fall apart on me when I'm sanding them or you know, using them for a costume or whatever. But I wouldn't even say that the ASA and ABS prints that I did in this video looked particularly melty. It's just sort of the nature of the filament. You know, you are not using a cooling fan generally at all. It's at like 10% until it gets to an overhang. So you're just talking about filament that is not cooling the same way that PLA and PETG are. You will just not be seeing those super smooth surfaces the same way that you will for aesthetic filaments like PLA. But I'm also not really using ABS and ASA in that way for aesthetic purposes. I'm printing in those materials for the purposes of prop building and I fully plan on doing like a full post-processing suite on them afterwards. So the 
the fact that the prints do look as good as they do to start off with is obviously very helpful for me and I possibly don't have to work as hard on the pieces in post-processing because they already look so good. But regardless, I always try and do really nice up close shots of all of the prints because everyone's opinion on what a good print looks like can be different. Some people might say that the ABS and ASA prints are just some of the smoothest prints they've ever seen and someone else might say there's a lot of room for improvement. But overall I would say that I am personally very happy with how the majority of these prints ended up looking like. A couple of features that I wanted to highlight and talk about that I really enjoyed on this particular machine. The first one is actually the build plate. It's technically a textured build plate but it is a lot smoother than a lot of other textured build plates that I have on various machines. I will try and insert some clips here that hopefully show the difference in texture but the closest way that I could describe this is it's almost like taking some of my other textured build plates and almost putting like a thin layer of epoxy or something so it does still have a bit of that texture but it is smoothed out more. Sometimes I find some of the build plates almost too textured to the point that it can almost start affecting the prints themselves like the filament almost can barely start sticking to some of them because the surface is just so uneven. But that was never an issue on this machine. I've probably captured the crazy perfect first layers that this printer was giving me. This printer is set up to be compatible with multicolor printing in the future. The Cheaty Box I believe is set to release early next year at some point. And so because of that it has the filament cutter and then like the nozzle cleaner and scraper and all of that stuff that will become necessary when you do start looking at changing out filaments and swapping them out through an AMS printing process. Even though the multicolor functionality isn't something that's happening with this machine yet, the filament cutter is actually incredibly useful. I didn't realize how much it was something that I avoided with my other Chidi printers, but I basically have all of my other ones set up as ABS machines, which does make sense. Even this one will probably become a majority ABS machine just because I kind of dedicate the enclosed ones to printing ABS and ASA since they're the only ones that can do it successfully. You saw throughout this video how much I was swapping different filament types and I did not do it linearly. Like I printed ABS first, then I switched to PLA, then I switched back to ASA, and then I switched to PETG. Like it was all over the place and I was thinking about it and it is something quite cumbersome, <laughs> maybe we should call it. It's just not as convenient of an experience to do on the other Chidi printers the same way that it is on this machine. In fact, I think that's how I screwed up one of my nozzles one time is I switched from like PLA to ABS or actually I think it was the other way around and there was still ABS stuck in the nozzle and of course ABS prints at an entirely different temperature than PLA does and it gave me a lovely clog that of course screwed up whatever I was printing at the time but that is absolutely not an issue with this printer when you go to do the reload or unload filament setting like preset that's built in on this machine it goes and cuts cuts it in the filament cutter and then starts purging it out the back and then you can just load in the next filament and it seems to do an incredible job at cleaning all of whatever filament you want out of the nozzle. I'm sure a big draw for some people for this printer will be the multicolor functionality of it but if you are somebody that is looking at this machine just for its single color printing that is a feature that I think you will appreciate as well. The nozzle cleaning system also seems to work really great. It has that silicone sort of scrub rubber on the one side that seems to do a really good job at cleaning any extra filament debris off of the nozzle and just overall I've never particularly noticed any filament debris becoming an issue when it goes to start printing so so far it seems to be cleaning off the nozzle as it should be. One thing that you will definitely want to print first though is some sort of poop shoot, filament shoot, whatever you want to call it because this thing does fling <laughs> the purged filament from the backside. I probably still have like little bits of filament back there from when I was using it on this desk and before I printed a filament shoot for it. It's quite impressive just how far it will launch the filament. Definitely print some sort of poop shoot situation. Again, even if you are planning on only using it for the one color filament, it does create a bit of purged filament every time that it goes to set up 
the next print job and heat up the nozzle and everything just to make sure the filament's all properly loaded and flowing from the nozzle. Overall, I really like the aesthetic of this machine. It's really sleek and high-end looking and also feeling a lot sleeker than the plus three feels. Although again, aesthetics of a machine are kind of a non-issue. But something that is a bit more of a practical feature would be the glass door and top cover, I guess you would call it, the lid. The glass seems to keep the heat in this machine incredibly well, but it is also so much nicer to look through and also film through compared to the plexiglass or whatever the X plus three and X max three have. It's not like you can't see through the plexiglass on those machines, but this glass is just so much nicer. So yes, I am a big fan of this glass upgrade. But the counterpart of this is the hot end design. And I don't mean the functionality of the design itself. I mean the aesthetics of the hot end just don't seem to match the rest of the machine, which I am fully acknowledging is essentially a non-issue. But the one area that I could see this making a difference does sort of come back to the filming aspect. The one part of a 3D printer that you will see when a machine is printing and there's photos or videos of that printer somewhere online or otherwise is the hot end. That is why I would assume pretty much all printer companies slap their company name and also what machine it is on the hot end somewhere that it will always be captured in those photos and videos. So it is overall an acknowledgement that the look of a hot end is important because that is something that is visibly seen a lot. If you were not as well versed in 3D printers and you saw some video footage of this machine working with that hot end, I could understand why you would maybe come to the conclusion that it was not a current generation printer. It just doesn't look very high tech and it might be the gray plastic because I've come to realize over the years that I just dislike the gray plastic. Maybe it's not that I dislike the gray plastic, but when I see gray plastic on anything, the first things that come to mind are old video game consoles. The NES, the GameCube, PlayStation I believe was gray at one point, older, technology always used to be this gray plastic. And it looks an awful lot like the gray plastic that the hot end is made out of. Now, would the aesthetics of this hot end dissuade me from purchasing this machine? Absolutely not. But I do think that there is a decent argument there as to why the aesthetics of a hot end should be seriously considered and kept in mind. The only other thing that I had a slight issue with was the PTFE tube rubbing up against the lid of this printer because I'm generally printing in ABS and ASA and filaments that you need to stay enclosed, I'm like never taking this lid off. Even with PLA and PETG, I open the door, I leave the lid on. But because of that, it means that that PTFE tube is constantly rubbing up against that lid. It was an easy enough fix with the zip tie. I might look into a more aesthetic solution than a zip tie there. Printer find one of those clips that's like running against the cable chain or even try and put it within the cable chain. If you are somebody that is planning on keeping the lid on this printer, then I would say do something about the PTFE tube. Honestly, even just possibly shortening the length so that there wasn't so much excess of bending from the hot end and extruder could have helped the height and where it was hitting the lid, but the zip tie situation worked out fine. Another thing that is not really the printer's fault, but I did just want to mention it in this video for the sake of it being thorough. I have the majority, if not all of my 3D printers plugged into some various battery backup power source around my workshop, but it is just a standard that I do at this point because I print such large pieces and it's always just for peace of mind because knowing my luck, there will be like a five millisecond power outage that will just throw off my whole print job. But if I tried heating up the bed of this machine and have the heater going to try and bring up the enclosure temperature, it would overload the battery backup. Now this had me looking up what the wattage of this printer was supposed to be compared to the X Max 3 because I would have assumed that the X Max would have possibly drawn more power given it's a bigger machine, but that has never been an issue with that printer and it's been constantly on a battery backup. They are technically supposed to both be around the 900 watt mark. Actually lower, I'm 90% sure that the information for this printer that I could find had the bed being rated at 400 and the 
enclosure heater being rated at 400. So it should have been at 800 and my battery backups are nine. If I try and heat up the bed of this printer at the same time as the enclosure heater, it freaks the battery backup out. It starts beeping at me. The first time I did it, I really freaked out because I thought it was the printer itself making this beeping noise. So this printer is supposed to have a more intense heater, which is what I'm assuming is causing the overloading to happen, even though it's technically still not supposed to be the wattage that my battery backup is at its max point. When it's printing, it's fine. It's literally just when it's heating up. And honestly, I don't even know how much the enclosure heater runs on this printer really when I'm printing ABS because when I've got this whole setup going, it stays at a nice balmy like 55 degrees Celsius and I typically have my heater set for 50. So it shouldn't really be adding to the hot air situation. It is a unique issue, something to keep in mind if you are also someone that uses battery backups on their printers because this is the only one so far that I've had this experience with. Again, that's not something that's like affecting print quality or anything with this machine, but I did just want to mention it here for the sake of information purposes. It's editing Michaela butting in because there is actually quite a large issue that's come up since recording this part of the video. I'm going to link to the Nazi Works video below who does a great job explaining this in detail and a way to temporarily fix the issue. But the short explanation is due to the current design, the bed can fully block the chamber heater, causing the thermal runaway sensors to be triggered and completely ruining your print. When I first heard about this, I had no idea how this didn't happen to me since I was trying to push this printer to its max build volume and was majority using ABS and the chamber heater, but apparently the tallest piece I printed was around the 265 millimeter mark and it's at 270 millimeters and above where it's fully blocked. Right now, the workaround is adding some custom G code to the printer configuration and slicer, but really the only way for this to get fixed is changing the design of the chamber heater vent. In theory, all it would take would be to have the vent hole be wider so that it can never fully be obstructed, which is why this is so frustrating and really just sucks because this printer was working so well and had so much going for it. I mean, it still does, but this is a really unfortunate mistake and sloppy oversight, and it's not something that can be truly 100% fixed with firmware updates. So uh, yeah, that's that's the very unfortunate update I had to make for this video. So do with this information what you will and uh, back to the much more positive me. But overall, I've had a great couple of weeks with this printer. I'm sure you're going to see me use it a whole lot more in future builds. It's been really reliable for me. I've just been pressing print and letting it do its thing. It has a lot of really nice quality of life features. Camera's really decent. I have no issue seeing a live view of what the machine is printing. It produces time lapses, which I know is always like a hit or miss as to whether that's a feature anyone really cares about, but if you are into creating 3D printing content for the internet, it is very helpful. It has the automatic bed leveling, but it also has the ability to do manual adjustments if something isn't printing as you would prefer it to. It has that slightly more precise control that I personally really appreciate on machines. You know, if I start a print job and I realize that it maybe seems to be printing a bit too fast for either the piece that I'm printing or the filament that I'm using, I have no issue turning that print speed down directly on the machine. You know, no presets there. If I want it to print at 80%, I can just type in 80% and it will do its thing. As I have previously mentioned about the Chidi enclosed machines, I always just wish they would actually be a cubed build volume. The height is always where it's shorter and it is always the area where I start to see pieces not fitting. So maybe in general, I just wish that the enclosed printers would be still slightly taller on the Z axis because that would really mean that full-size helmets pretty much regardless of type would start fitting on these printers. It can still fit a ton of full-scale helmets in one piece though, but it is always the height where something starts to not fit in one piece. And it would obviously be nice if that wasn't the case. If you're someone that's in the market for a great all around reliable printer that can basically print any filament you could possibly think of and is also at that larger build volume, then I would definitely say that the plus four would be worth looking into. So far it's given me beautiful prints and I am definitely going to be using it a ton in the future. If you are interested in finding out more about the Chidi Plus 4, there will be links in the description box, along with any other links I promised in this video, as well as links to all of the models that I printed. But that is everything, so thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in my next video.